So here I'm going to talk about some real data sources and uh, some macroeconomic variables that can be used in macroeconomic data analysis. I usually talk about this in my Economics 343 course at Northeastern Illinois University. Um, when I started in spring 2019, but this is pretty good um, in all sorts of applications. So generally speaking, you might have taken a macroeconomic theory course or an introductory macro course. You learn about where the data come from or where the variables are, you know, what they mean or how they're calculated. But here, this is really about how to get the data and how to transform them into a way that you could use them for some uh, real macroeconomic analysis, right? So start off by talking a little bit about some sources. Um, in the U.S., um, a good source is the Bureau of Labor Statistics or Bureau of Economic Analysis. Uh, this gives you unemployment and wage and stuff like that. BEA gives you a GDP components as well as some foreign trade, balance of payments and stuff like that. Um, a lot of students overuse FRED, which is the Federal Reserve Economic Data Database. Um, this draws from all sorts of different sources. Is, um, has thousands of data uh, points, do a lot of transformations, but a lot of times people only go to FRED. Um, there's really a lot of sources out there besides that. Um, outside of the U.S., um, Eurostat is good. It gives a lot of regional uh, data. And then one thing I like to do is to go to actual central bank websites. You could like, go to the Bank of Mexico. Um, a lot of it has an English site. Just look for the British flag. Um, or if you know the language, it could help too, because sometimes they have reports and stuff that haven't been translated. So um, one way to get there is to Google it, Google Bank of Mexico, but every site, once you get there, is a little tricky to navigate. Um, you, you have to find something that says data or statistics and kind of work through it. You can choose variables, and you download it. And like I always say, you, you get an Excel file or a comma-separated values file. That can be pulled into software, right? So you shouldn't download P PDFs, for example, right? Um, um, a lot of times in international finance, I use international financial statistics. Uh, it used to be uh, subscription-based, uh, or you go through your library. Now it's free. It's a little uh, difficult to navigate, but uh, finding the variables, but it has a ton of stuff. And, and you might find that the same variables are the same across because they're reported to different agencies the same way. So this might be the same as central bank data, but it's all in one place. You can select all the countries and all the frequencies you want, um, and then it's, you can get a huge database. People use World Bank indicators. I don't do that too much. Or the Pen World table people use for development. But there's a lot of sources outside of Fred. Okay, so you can download the data. I talk about how to get that elsewhere, but and I talk about it in class. But you can get um, a lot of way, um, a lot of different data. Um, you can make a nice database. Right? Now, this is just a look at the variables that I talk about in my class. Um, this gives um, my notation, which I use across all my courses. But these are general macro variables and you might have seen them again in like a macro theory course or something like that. I've got variable and this is my notation for it. Frequency, this is yearly or quarterly, monthly, and you can get daily. Um, you can also get some of these minute by minute, but I don't do anything that you can't do for, for macro. So this is not so much financial as it is macro. So GDP, for example, is yearly or quarterly, um, but you can't get monthly. Uh, it does not exist. Um, and I kind of mentioned over here that you know you might get GDP, but if you want monthly data, you could use the in index of industrial production which people use as a proxy variable that's, that stands in for it. Um, and then people could use GNP or like net national product. For the most part, you want GDP. Um, and a lot of times it's in U.S. dollars or it could be in the national currency. So make sure that if you're, uh, depending on your database, it could be in U.S. or it could be in uh you know, pesos, for example, and then you might have to convert over. Um, one important thing is that things that are international, like FDI, this is, might be always in dollars. So it's in dollars for Mexico, but GDP for Mexico's pesos, you have to turn them both into the same currency using the exchange rate. Okay, so note the unit. Could be dollars, could be local currency, but this is some sort of, you know, unit of currency. All right, um, some transformations you can do are over here. So I've got the variations, which are different kind of versions of the variables, right? So GNP and GDP are not the same, um, but you might get all of these in your database. Um, transformations are things you can do to it. So you can take GDP divided by price level, and you get the real GDP, which you probably know from your courses. One thing you could do, I have an asterisk because this requires more statistics, but you could uh, draw out the business cycle. So a lot of times I take log real GDP, Hodrick Prescott filter, or some other approved filter, and then you get the business cycle. Okay, um, but a lot of times you can get the growth rate pretty straightforward, so you might already know that. You take the percentage change or the log change in your real GDP, and that will give you the percentage change, All right? Um, so that's kind of one of the biggest macro variables, but my table sort of set up across for this. Um, got the variables, the frequencies, the units, different variations, um, and then what you can do with it. Now, this is not comprehensive. I try to do as much as I can, but there is always more you could find. 
All right. Um, so this is just a good start, but but I, if anything's missing, it's just because this is uh, uh, not entirely comprehensive. Okay. Now I have consumption, which is a GDP component, and I've got other real variables. These are also yearly and quarterly. Savings you might be interested in. Um, one thing is you might have savings as a percentage of GDP, right? So you take savings divided by GDP, both in nominal terms, you know, and then multiply by 100, and then you get, uh, you know, savings could be 12% of GDP, for example. I is investment. Um, a lot of times you might have to find a different variable, such as gross fixed capital formation, um, or changes in inventories are also included, but you can get another real GDP component. G is government spending, and there's all sorts of different versions in the database. Um, but again, you could have real government spending, percentages GDP, or the growth of government spending. P is price level. Uh, this, this you can get a monthly CPI. It's an index, right? There's no unit on it, and it has a base year of 100. And then CPI is most common, but you could also have producer price index or personal consumption expenditures. Again, percent changes would be the inflation rate. One thing I like to do is the ratio of two, right? So one thing I do in class is educational prices over normal CPI. You can see that education rises faster than all prices. N, I call the employment rate, the number of workers, the labor force. Um, in other classes, I call it L, but here it's N. Uh, this could also possibly be monthly. This is a number of workers, and you could also do the percentage changes. U's unemployment rate also comes out monthly as well as yearly and quarter. This is a percentage. The U.S. has U3, which is narrower or a lower rate. U6 includes underemployment and some marginally attached workers. It might be a higher percentage, um, but though that would be the unemployment rate for the U.S. R is the interest rate, which can also be daily as well as yearly, quarterly, and monthly. This is a percentage change year over year usually. Um, the U.S. has the Fed funds rate, but you can, in other countries you can have the discount rate, lending, savings, money market, government corporate bonds. A lot of times they have multiple interest rates across countries. Right? Um, real interest rates you control for inflation, so it's nominal minus inflation. And then you could also do an interest rate differential, which is simply one minus the other. P.S. P. Superscript S is stock prices. Again, also can be daily. This is an index like the Dow Jones, Standard & Poor's. Japan is the Nikkei. There's many other U.S. or foreign indices. Um, one thing you can do is log changes or percentage changes. That gives you the growth rate in stock prices. Here's commodity prices, right, which can also be daily. Sometimes this is in dollars as well. You can have the oil price, like West Texas Intermediate, but you notice I don't mention Brent or Urals or anything, but this is the oil price. You can get copper prices and other metals. This can also be in dollars, or you can have an index. And again, percentage changes in commodity prices are pretty common. MS is money supply, right? It can also be monthly as well as yearly and quarterly. This is, could be a dollar value of the money stock. Monetary base M1 or M2 are used in the U.S. Some, some countries use M3. And then I've got, uh, you can have the real money supply, which is controlling, divided by prices, and then you could also have uh, M2 as a percentage of GDP, for example, as a measure of financial depth. Right? There's a lot you can do with these. Reserves, right? the reserve stock, uh, including or excluding gold, I use that when I talk about exchange market pressure. You can have real reserves. Um, one thing I use is it's that it's, you divide by the money supply, um, monetary base, and then you could also have reserves over imports which a lot of times talks about how much reserves are available to pay for those imports. All right, so again, I'm just giving you a taste of what you can do with this. All right, E, I use a lot. This is, I call this E, but it's the exchange rate, which again, it's a financial price. It can be very high frequency. Um, one thing I should mention is that you can get really high frequency data if you're willing to pay for it. I'm only talking about free sources. There's a lot of places that will sell you variables, and I've never had that kind of money. So you have, you know, whatever frequency you can find. All right, this is some sort of currency per dollar, but it could also be flipped. You could have dollars per currency, and you should always remember what your numerator and denominator denominator are. Dollars per peso, pesos per dollar, it makes a difference. Don't get it backwards. All right. You can have the nominal exchange rate, which is simply what's given. A real exchange rate controls for two countries' price levels. Um, bilateral means two-sided. That could be dollars per pesos. But you can also have an effective exchange rate index. This is like a trade-weighted index. It's like, a, it's like a CPI. Numerous price indices. Um, all in one combined with weights giving some sort of exchange rate that equals 100, and if it rises, the currency is rising. All right, you can take log changes for appreciations. You can take real exchange rates, right, like I mentioned over here. And one thing you can also have is cross rates. If you took dollars per peso divided by um, euros per peso, you could get dollars per euro. All right, so you could actually have a trilateral exchange rate where you could turn two pairs into a third pair. Here, exports and imports, which are 
GDP components, usually yearly and quarterly. This could be in currency value as well. Again, you can do the same things that you can do, right? A real exports, you could have exports as percentage of GDP. Um, you could have the growth in exports. One thing I didn't mention here is that I could take exports plus imports as a percentage of GDP, and that's a measure of openness, right? So a measure of trade openness um, is exports plus imports over GDP, okay? This could be export prices or import prices, prices of exports or imports. This could be an index or dollar value. And then again, there's different versions depending if you do international trade. This is free on board and this is cost insurance and freight. This is basically lower transport costs are included. This includes more transport costs. So that could be a difference in these price indices. Okay, depending on whether those costs are included. One thing you could have is like a, a terms of trade, which is an export import price ratio. And people can use that to talk about a country's competitiveness. Current account, right, which is mostly exports plus imports, but it also includes financial flows, or um, excuse me, the factor payment flows. Capital account, um, sometimes it's called KFA for capital financial account. The correct name is actually financial account, but a lot of economics literature calls it, calls it KA for capital account. That's a little bit outdated, so make sure you know exactly what variables are included. And then again, you could have real divided by prices or percentage of GDP. And a lot of times these can be used for a measure of financial openness. Right? And then within the capital or financial account, there's foreign direct investment and uh, portfolio investment. I talk about this elsewhere, but this is long-term stable ownership ownership of a firm, uh, greater than 10% ownership, and then portfolio is less than 10% ownership, which is more unstable financial transactions. Um, this is usually in dollars, yearly or quarterly. Inward would be liabilities and outward would be assets. And again, these are used when we're talking about capital flows. Okay, so I put some notes down here. Um, this is not exhaustive. There's all sorts of stuff you could do with these depending on what you need, but these are a good place to start. Um, this is a number versus currencies and stuff. So I talk about my notation, then I talk about indices. Um, you know, there's, and uh, one thing uh, with, with my notation, I use this across my courses, but this is generally, you know, one way of um, talking about the variables. This, this is commonly used. I do not make these up, but you might see different letters. Like I use L for labor sometimes. You might see different notations. Just make sure that when you're looking at these data that you're making sure that they're in the right units, um, making sure you're converting, right? If you have one in pesos and one in dollars, you might have to use the exchange rate. Make sure your units line up. Make sure. Uh, one other thing, um, is if you have 2% as 2 and then you subtract 1%, make sure it's as 1 and not 0 0.01, right? So you, one, one trick is always make sure that your, your notations and your percentages line up. Um, it takes a little bit of work when you look at your database, but for now, we, we know some sources we can go to, particularly in the U.S. as well as other countries. And then we have a beginning of a list of what variables we might want to think about for uh, macro data analysis, um, what it will look like, how, what frequency it is, and, and what different variations, and finally, what we could do with it, what sort of transformations we can do.